Patty, it's great to be with you again on our second episode of GBAC TV. How are things up in, let's see, you're on a beach in Florida, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, I'm up here in West Michigan. Yeah, uh, prob- you know. Probably already walked your dogs for the day. Yep. Yeah. Well, um, I think we're going to talk today about the future of mass gatherings. I think that's our hot topic. And we have a panel of experts from the event and venue uh, groups that we're going to visit with. So let's go see what they're up to and see what we can learn. Oh, that's wonderful. You know, the the event industry, whether it's conventions, trade shows, uh, our sporting industries have been really challenged this year. Some, you know, hurt, um, de- devastated in some areas. Some states have here in the United States has allowed them to continue moving forward. Um, I've been an advocate that people can have conventions as long as they have the procedures and SOPs and risk assessments completed and people behave while they're there, um, that you have the right SOPs for cleaning, sanitization, disinfection, uh, infection prevention measures. And we've we've had some really great um, examples of how they've been able to do that successfully. And we're seeing that the need to get back um, to some sort of normalcy, it will be different uh, going forward, but it, people are ready. And this is a group of people that we're gonna to talk to today that are awesome and that are leaders in this area. Yeah, I can't wait to hear what they have to say and, and we'll learn about what's coming up and what, what these uh, venues are doing to make it safe for attendees. So let's go see who we have. Let's go. Well, Patty and I are both pleased to invite you three gentlemen to our program today. With us is David Dubois, the president and CEO of the International Association of Exhibitions and Events. David, how are you this afternoon? Well, good day, Jeff, and thanks for having me. Glad to have you. And we have Mark Herrera, who's the director of education and life safety at the International Association of Venue Managers. Mark, welcome. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks for having me. And Rick Simon, he's the president and CEO of the United Service Companies. Hello, Rick. Hello, Jeff. Thanks for having me. Yeah, great to have you all. Patty, I believe this is your slate of experts for the day. Isn't that true? Absolutely. These are gentlemen that I have had the pleasure of working with over this last year and, and learning from and mentoring with, um, being mentored by uh, in this industry. And it has been an industry that has been devastated in some areas. And um, these are the three of the gentlemen that are really working hard to get it back up and running. Yes, all hard workers. And we're seeing the benefits of that as events start happening again, these mass gatherings. That's our topic today. Now, what's the future hold? And we have a few questions for you, gentlemen. Um, And the first one is kind of like we want to take the temperature of the industry, the venue industry events. If you were to look back over the past year and grade the response to the pandemic, what would you what would you do for a grade? Would it be an A, B, C, D, or did we fail? Uh, Rick, why don't we start with you? I don't think we were prepared at all. Uh, I mean, I think that we've all done a great job over the years of having emergency preparedness plans. We know what to do in a fire, in an attack, IAVM, IAA have done phenomenal work in preparing us for every eventuality except a pandemic. Who ever thought of a pandemic? That's something that happened in ancient times. It doesn't happen anymore. And we didn't, I don't think we were prepared for it. Um, I mean, if you look at the actions we took, we shut down shows. We said, we're going to be shut down for about two weeks. Well, I kind of knew that was wrong when they said it, but I was thinking maybe a month or two. We fully expected to be back in business by July, August. And of course we missed that by almost a year. Um, so I don't think we were prepared. I will tell you though, since then, I think with the collaboration, we've gotten a tremendous amount of education. And if we had hit the, the replay button on this, I think we could act swiftly and with great education, with great experience and great collaboration. So I think the groups that have worked together have done a great job but I don't think we were prepared for this in the beginning. So you didn't give us an actual grade, but it sounds like a pretty bad grade to start, but it got better as the year went on is, is my interpretation of that. Would you agree with that, Rick? Things got better. I do. I I think it got better. And I think that GBAC had a lot to do with it. 
because it became the benchmark, the standard for the industry as IAVM and IAA embraced it. Um, and it brought a lot of benefits other than the scientific benefits. It brought a standard that in a, in a group of well-regarded scientists that we could, because my fear was as this thing developed is that we're gonna have, we, do, uh, we have convention centers in many, many states and arena, arenas and stadiums in all, this, in all 50 states. Every state regulator and every county regulator is going to have a different set of regulations. We'll be here till 2092 trying to figure this out. And I think GBAC setting the standard really helped, uh, you know, a sense of conflict. In case in point, in Las Vegas uh, yesterday, a, a trade show opened. And it's in large part, as the, uh, the regulators in Nevada and Clark County were figuring out who came first, the chicken or the egg. You know, we gave them, we prepared them with all the G back. And they said, okay, fine, this works. And they allowed the show to happen. And now we've got another major show coming in in June. And Vegas is going to start opening up. Orlando's done this. And now the other cities are kind of seeing this and saying, well, okay, this kind of works. And I think you're going to see not a rapid opening, but this collaboration and the, the setting the standard really helped making people feel safe, be safe. And most importantly, all of the people that are stakeholders getting together and agreeing on a process, because we generally think of the, the stakeholders as the contractor, the show organizer, and the venue. Very seldom do we deal with the regulators. And all of a sudden, we got a new set of people in here that are regulators, and they're not used to this. You know, and I'm sure as Mark can comment, dealing with the government regulators more than any of us, you know, they're used to saying no. You know, no is a lot easier answer than yes. So we, this really took away a lot of the no's. Well, thank you, uh, Rick. Mark, what do you think? Um, give us a grade. Oh, listen, a grade would be, I'd say we failed right from the very beginning, right? Because to Rick's point, there was so much that was unknown, right? You know, all we knew was that we had a duty to act. We had to do, it was our civic duty as an industry to come together and figure out how this thing makes sense, right? What is this pandemic all about? What is this virus about, first of all? And, and, and getting the industry to try to understand that was a challenge, right? So I would say we initially failed, but the one thing that Rick said that was right on the money is that, listen, if we had to, if we ever go through this again, right? Through training, education, working groups, oh, we had six, we had about six working groups to, de to, to develop and build recovery guides. We had three of which just worked with the GBAC group and that process to do what was reasonable within these facilities. And that is implement some type of a standard where there's accountability and where it also influences decision makers that within the, the local states that, hey, you're doing what is right, what is reasonable based on scientific evidence and information that is coming across. So listen, when GBAC came out in front of us, uh, you know, obviously Rick is the one that had mentioned it to, you know, to David and, and was really a strong advocate of it. And then all of a sudden we aligned with GBAC. We knew that at this point we were going to build some teams that focused on accreditation to do what was right within those venues. So um, if we had to pivot again in the future, I would say that we would be very, um, you know, successful. But, you know, what? It, what's interesting is there's some really great things that came out of this, and that is collaboration. I can't, I'm all about team, right? And I'll tell you what, to work with IAEE and ESCA, cultural properties, faith-based organizations, you know, we have that bi-weekly COVID call that has everyone, right? It's got the federal government. It's got infectious disease. It's a part of it. And that was part of GBAC because we had somebody from infectious disease that even joined us there, CDC, right? All of us came together to try to make sense of this and to do what's right. So we didn't base our decisions and all of our recovery guides on, on emotion. We based it on the evidence that was in front of us that we felt was very reasonable to kick off these events. Yeah, the, the science information that developed from this is, is very impressive. Well, David, let's get your thoughts. Give us a grade. I, I'm sure it's not gonna be good either. Well, I'm, I'm going to agree with uh, Rick and Mark uh, for, for an obvious reason. They're former law enforcement officers. 
that um, I highly respect. Right, Patty? Uh, right. And <laughs> plus, they're good friends. And, and, and as Mark said, when, when Rick called me about a year ago and said, hey, Dubois, you got to support GBAC, I, as Mark said, I, I said, first of all, let me get in front of my computer and Google GBAC and ISSA. I knew ISSA, Patty, but I didn't know GBAC. And look, look what has happened with the collaboration that has taken place in the last year. My goodness, I, I, I think uh, there are, Jeff, over 2,000 facilities that have been certified. Uh, and another 1,000 plus I read recently in your press releases that are in queue uh, mm -hmm. to go through the process. So my goodness, uh, we, we had a lousy grade. We had a, a D or an F to begin with, but think about where we are today. If something like this happens again, Godspeed, God willing that it doesn't, we're going to be very prepared. And Mark and I were talking earlier about the safety initiative that uh, uh, IE and IVM and Rick's team as part of his businesses were working on for years. And we mitigated uh, in convention centers uh, terrorism because of the great conversations, right, Mark, that we had in a collaborative effort. So, Jeff, um, we didn't do well, but I tell you what, we're as close as uh, we can be to, to having a grade of about a B plus or an A right now. Well, that's encouraging to hear. Uh, Patty, maybe some thoughts from you, and I think you have the next question for our panel. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, I mean, I had written an article in actually for Jeff in the fall of 2019, and it was published the very uh, first week of 2020 and it was the I guess the underlying title was the pandemic a pandemic is coming and we're not prepared and it had nothing to do with SARS-CoV-2 it was just the learning that a lot of us had seen through the Ebola outbreak through other things with the um, swine flu uh, and what we saw was the fact that you know we put in place a lot of these plans and we put in place a lot of effort on you know uh, bombing and shoot around campuses and all these other types of things but when we looked at the front lines and we looked at the areas that are going to be affected the most and how we're going to mitigate it we really weren't we really weren't prepared and you know lo and below you know lo and behold look what happened two weeks later who announced that we were in the midst of the beginnings of a pandemic so I'm going to shake up the questions a little bit here, Jeff. Uh, one of the things, you know, we're seeing is the ability to reopen and we're seeing it differently in different states as, as Rick had alluded to. We saw Florida continue to reopen, you know, and be open. I went to a show back in August. Um, I think we saw each other there, <laughs> um, David. And it was one of those things where they were able to successfully do it following the protocols that we were starting to put in place and working with everybody. But we're seeing the need to reopen. What are you seeing things such as um, you know, in, you know, vaccinations, uh, requirements, testing. I know Rick, you were involved with a show here not too long ago where there were testing, um, uh, COVID positive, negative, and based on the, uh, the results, you would be allowed in the show. Uh, here in this short term, what types of things are you seeing versus um, what types of things long term? Well, I Rick? think that. I think that uh, to answer your question about the testing, yes, we did. No, you can't. It just won't work. I mean, the show organizer, their original thought was we're going to test everybody every day. And we procured, um, uh, with the help of others, some 30,000 of the, uh, uh, what you call it, lab test, the instant testing, the, mm -hmm. the quick testing. But the logistics of setting up we took an entire exhibit hall at the Orange County Convention Center, 100 plus thousand feet, so we could queue people up and have them in line. And they had to be, you know, a, 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 a scheduled appointments. Uh, you know, we terrified them by saying, if you miss your appointment, you will wait in line up to four hours. And that terrifies anybody. <laughs> um, but you just can't do it. Forget the expense. The expense was ridiculous. You just can't do it. It just won't work in our industry. To testing on site. So we try to talk them into 
doing the, you know, like the Hawaii does, just follow the Hawaiian website at the time, testing 72 hours in advance at your home, Walgreens or whatever, <clears throat> excuse me. But now they were insisting it be done on site. That was a one and done that'll never happen again. It's just not cost effective and it's logistically a nightmare. We only had about 5,000 people. If we had the typical 30,000 people that show up to this event, they'd still be in line. The, uh, so that, that's kind of the testing. The, you know, what do we see that's, that's new? I mean, we've went through the electrostatic disinfection. I think hand sanitizer every 200 linear feet in the aisle is here to stay. Mm -hmm. I think that that's become a new part of the culture. You know, you can shake hands again. You can do all the stuff. You might cough or sneeze and you, but you use hand sanitizer frequently. And I think that's, nobody's offended if you put hand sanitizer on. I think that the one thing that you said is, you know, about evolving. I think things are evolving faster than we realize. I think the next step, and, and Mark, I'll get you some information to you too, David, on what I see in the next step is listening to the CDC with air quality. We all agree now that the CDC finally said, well, it's, you know, because, you know, we're wiping down things. We've got people in these events with yellow shirts on to say disinfection team. And if it's not moving, we wipe it down every three minutes. We spray it, we wipe it, we, you know, we're polishing it and everything else. Uh, and as Patty said a long time ago, it's sanitation theater. Um, it's good. I mean, there's an effect, but you're spending a lot of money for one or 2% of the result. It's an airborne transmission, not just COVID, but the flu, the common cold and everything else. And there's now products hitting the market and equipment hitting the market that Patty, you guys are gonna have to validate sooner than later because it's what I see is the wild west out there. I'm approached every single day with a new guy that's got the new widget that's gonna purify the air. And half of them or more are nonsense are absolute nonsense. I mean, the one guy's flew in from India to make a presentation and yet India is having the worst, you know, catastrophic, oh, we have hundreds of thousands of units all over India. Obviously these people were not where you had your units. So, but I do, I do think, and I think the science bears it out and I'll let you come on that Patty, that air, air purification is the next frontier for us. And there's a couple of products that I've seen that, you know, Patty, you're aware of one of them, I'll send you the other one that I do like based upon the, my limited ability to read the science in it and the, and the reports, but the, uh, the, the tests that have been done seem to be solid. So I think really that's where we wanna go. And that in my mind would probably take away some of the stuff we do. I think you might be with air purification and hand sanitizer and the rest of the stuff could kind of evaporate. Your masks could go away. Your uh, overnight disinfection could go away. Maybe, but you know, that's kind of what I see coming up next. Mm -hmm. Mark? So I think Rick brings up some really valid points. Listen, one of the things that, you know, when you talk about air purification and airflow and your HVAC system, we've had tons of conversation with engineering companies that, you know, said, hey, here's where, here's where you have to maintain your humidity levels, et cetera, et cetera. Here's how you need to push your, your direct airflow, make sure that you're not exposed to stagnant air, et cetera. I think it's more that because again, you know, these are air, these are particles, these are microbial particles at the end of the day. They can travel, in my opinion, they can travel up to 30 feet. And I think Gavin even told me that. He goes, they can travel for long distances, right? So what are the precautions that you're using? And airflow needs to be something that needs to be taken into consideration. Now, granted, many venues now. Um, you know, obviously cleanliness is going to be a, a priority for venue operations. We see it. It's, it's there now. This plan takes diligence and thoroughness to a whole new level. So they're already doing that. And a big part of that is also if you have your teams within those facilities that are, that, that are constantly cleaning and making sure that they're doing everything right uh, with, with disinfecting and cleaning. Well, again, that's that level of confidence that people need to see. People are more apt to actually sh actually show up to these to these events, but where venues have outlined a plan to maintain a standardized approach to cleaning, you know, they've included the top to bottom uh, cleaning approach using um, you know they're really focused now on what is EPA regulated products, right? Registered cleaning, disinfecting products and chemicals, 
and they're focusing on all the high touch services that that's not going to that's not going to go away. Implementation of different levels of cleaning and disinfecting that was implemented within within a lot of our facilities. And again, just establishing confidence in our guests. You talk about um, some of the newest tools and best practices for contactless screening uh, of arriving guests. These are the discussions that that we've been having, um, you know, and then all of the training resources now that, that are available, one being through you, you folks, Patty, through uh, GBAC, and the training resources are going to be available to, to the industry. Um, those are just a few things. And then I'm not even touching right now on the security posture, because that in itself, I just got off of a call with the Department of Homeland Security, where I do chair the public assembly side. Uh, through the subsector coordinating council. And listen, we're, we're very anemic in a lot of areas and just focused on what are those health protocols. There's another train coming from the other side. And that is they're trying to exploit our facilities for the media attention uh, while they're exposed to this health crisis, right? So training these teams on how to manage these conditions and situations and giving them the intel, that's another thing that we're also also focused on, uh, Patty. And, and yeah, you have the discussions regarding vaccinations, right? Who's being vaccinated? Who's not? Is it a requirement? Is it not? And these that's why we have these HR committee calls, because from a regulatory perspective, we want it hot off the press from HR, from SHRM, and EEOC. Wonderful. David? Well, they've touched on a lot of great points. I'm going to kind of take a different perspective from a customer perspective. Of course, IE represents you know the entire ecosystem of suppliers, you know, Rick's company, uh, venues, convention bureaus, convention centers, technology companies, etc. And I want to uh, to thank Rick for his uh, his uh, foresight year uh, not years ago, months ago. Uh, where we began talking about the need for um, tax credits. And ISSA uh, is doing an outstanding job of, of advocating for, uh, through Washington, D.C., legislative uh, credits, uh, cleaning credits, the ability for buildings and companies to um, get uh, tax credit advantages which are obviously will uh, help the financial strain that uh, is happening through uh, health and sanitation protocols that Rick and Mark have described so well. So uh, I just want to remind everybody that uh, it's not over. And, and I, I'm sure Rick can jump in here too, because uh, we have a lot of good work being done uh, still from a lobbying perspective to get these credits uh, accomplished and give some relief because this is not going away. As Rick said, this is not going to work. We've got to continue enhanced sanitation practices and protocols and, and guidelines. And they're, you know, there's cost to them. I, I'm not going to say they're overly expensive. Uh, everybody's got to share costs. I know, Mark, your venues uh, absorb a lot of costs, especially as, as was outlined, the, the air handlers and that type of uh, technology that uh, Rick has touched on uh, is, is not inexpensive. And a lot of that can be capitalized, but a lot of it obviously still has to be initially paid for, and that's a cash flow issue. Um, so I'm pleased to let you know that our industry continues to work with ISSA and work with the new Exhibitions and Conferences Alliance that uh, um, nine different organizations are involved with to make sure that we continue to get uh, credits. Uh, I don't know, Rick, Rick, if you want to add to that, because you're one of the advocates right up front. Well, thanks for teeing it up, David. The, uh, the Trade Show and Event Recovery Act, as we originally titled it, was really very simple. It could fit on one page. And that is that anybody that spends money to attend or exhibit in a trade show uh, would be able to use 100% of that money to get a uh, bottom line, get a 50% tax credit. Uh, the tax credit was, uh, could be carried. If it was a three-year sunset on the, on the legislation we saw it with a uh, five-year carry forward on the losses. And what does that mean in English? Is that we have seen this in 97, 08, after 9-11. We have the history on it, and they all three of them were identical. The 1,000-foot exhibitor goes down, if he shows up next year, goes down to 100 square feet. 
until he needs his vanity booth back. And that takes three to five years. So, and we, everybody on this call gets paid in square footage. You know, that's the medium we deal in. And so to expedite, in, instead of sending 10 reps with their 1,000 feet, they send one. So it's one hotel room and 100 square feet. The show organizer's not thrilled with 100 versus 1,000. This was the method by them saying, if I spend the money, I can take half of it off my taxes. And the reason, so it's truly a jump start. It's a three-year sunset. That was the original legislation. It's gone through a couple of iterations. It's somewhere in Congress, part of a bigger bill, which I have mixed emotions about. Because also when I teed this up with you guys, we had, you know, very, very few times as management and labor agree on things. So not only do we have management agreeing, but we had labor, the International Brotherhood of Teamsters, the International Brotherhood of Carpenters, to name two of the painters, right? We're signed on at the international level. Tell us who to call and whose cage to rattle because we're going to put their members back to work. So it worked for everybody and it's, it's kind of slowed down. But really, that would be something, Mark, that's going to help all of your venue members. It's going to help all of David's show organizers and it's going to help all of you know, companies like mine put more people back to work sooner. Because right now, as we all know, we're paying people to sit at home. We'd rather pay people to come to work. Yeah. Good, good information from our panel today. Uh, I have a question for you. If we're done, are we done with that one, Patty? Are we, do you cover it well enough? Okay. This one's kind of interesting. Thinking of it from an attendee perspective, if you could share with those coming to events, things you might be doing or event managers might be doing, preparing for an event, procedures, protocols, things behind the scenes that others, who, you know, attendees just don't know about. What would those things be? Are there such activities? Well, the attendees don't know anything about the place being, the venues being sprayed electro, with electrostatic uh, units with the uh, chemicals we use overnight. They don't see that. Uh, we're using uh, thermal imaging cameras where people can walk by them. They don't even know they're being screened unless we pull them out of, I mean, you walk, we put a potted plant in front of it. You don't even know you're being screened and we can screen people in mass. You know, we set the rope and stanchion far enough apart that five, six people abreast can walk by in waves through 3000 people an hour. And if somebody, we can see them on the, on the camera that they're warm. Right, right now, it's like less than 1% of the people are going to secondary screening. And we have yet to pull somebody out of line that if they sat down for a minute, they didn't pass in a minute or so just because they walked out of the hot sun or something. Mm -hmm. um, but it's something that most people are unaware of that we're doing because they don't see it right away. Um, so those are two of the things. They do see the hand sanitizer in the aisles. Um, I think that, you know, David, you might speak to some of the things that the show organizers, uh, even though it's, it's not in the protocol for GBAC, some of the show organizers are insisting that they widen the aisles. I don't know why, but they insist that a 30 foot aisle is better than a 10 foot aisle. So they can stand 30 feet apart and talk to one another. Uh, but if, there's a lot of behind the scenes things with each show organizer that, you know, they want to put their imprimatur on it, their fingerprint saying, this is what we're doing. But the big things are the spraying and the temperature taking right now. We all know that the, there's cleaning and disinfecting going on and your attendees know that, but these are great details, Rick, that you started uh, sharing. And you see the guys in our yellow shirts on disinfecting, as Mark pointed out, everything, all the touch points constantly from when the first exhibitor or first person arrives in the morning till the last one leaves at night. And then we go spray the, the premise afterwards. They see that. This mm -hmm. is what they don't see. Yeah. David? Yeah. Excuse me for going off camera for a second. Uh, uh, I live here in Dallas and we've got a big thunderstorm. It's, it kind of reminds me, Jeff, of what we've gone through the last year. We got a big thunderstorm, so it got really dark. So I had to step up and turn on the lights a little bit. But uh, to Rick's point, you know, it's a communication challenge. We need to, as show organizers, put in all of our registration and marketing materials, the all secure guidelines that were developed by the major show organizing companies uh, in our industry, global companies. 
Uh, and also IE's work uh, with IVM and Rick was on our committee to develop the essential guidelines for safely reopening exhibitions and events. Those two publications alone, if we could take snippets out of those, because obviously we don't expect, you know, uh, potential attendee A or potential exhibitor B to click on these right mark and read them all because they're pretty heavy documents. Uh, I think, Mark, your guidelines were about uh, 100, 100 plus pages and ours were about 65 and the All Secures were about 25. That's a lot of material. But, but Jeff, to your point and, and Rick's point, we need to do a better job of communicating to the X person and the Y person that, hey, not only is the facility GBAC accredited and safe and secure, well, how quickly can you explain what GBAC is, right? We've got to do that in a very defined and quick way. We have to talk about the fact that there are, there are all kinds of protocols going on. And by the way, I remember Patty saying, you know, when somebody said, well, well, we can't have carpet throughout an exhibit hall. And I think it was either you or Dr. Gavin said, well, you know, it's not an issue unless people are on their knees walking on the carpet. And, and then licking their hands because they've, they've experienced a, a, a uh, on the ground carpet uh, experience. I'll stop there and just say, Jeff, we have to do a much better, and we are doing a much better job of communicating that it is safe. And you know what, as vaccines get in the arms and as uh, the, the number of uh, COVID cases continue to drop, we're getting there. Yeah, well, that's good to hear. Patty, what's our next question? Well, you know, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, everybody's made some really amazing points about what we've, you know, how we've pivoted and how we're moving forward. I think we're still trying to figure out, you know, what that new, you know, if we, I'm going to say the term, the new normal, what it's going to look like a year from now, two years from now, three years from now. Um, like Rick said, there's going to be hand sanitizer everywhere. Um, we're going to, that's going to be probably with us forever. I think what Mark had indicated, which I thought was important, um, and everybody has actually, the training and education going forward, it's, you know, to be prepared, it's, it, it's with us to stay and to even build upon what we have done. Um, and that's gonna be a collaboration between, you know, everybody here on, on this call, as well as uh, some of the other collaborating organizations that we've been working with. And that's gonna be really important because what we found, I think, through this, and, and you know, correct me if, if you disagree, or, or is that it all comes down to you know these two words that a lot of people get scared about, and that's risk assessment, and saying you know we got to do a risk assessment, and I think that you know to Rick's point about the airborne, um, you know, in the very beginning, if you remember, CDC said you know it's not airborne, don't worry about it, kind of thing, and and you know your masks don't really work for protecting you and. And we realized that as we learned more, we learned more about the masks that we're wearing. We learned more about, you know, what we've been, had been saying all along was masks do work. Um, we knew it was airborne because of MERS and SARS and, and other coronaviruses, but that, you know, surfaces do count too. To what percentage, you know, we realized that it's airborne and you're much more likely to get infected via airborne but that we still needed to pay attention to the surfaces. And there was just so many unknowns. And we found that through our collaboration, through science-based technologies, looking at the, you know, if there's a silver lining, it's some of these innovations that we're seeing come forward, uh, you know, and we found that we were able to pivot. And as time goes on, we were able to pivot even more and we found each other. <laughs> I think that was also the beauty of this is that we found each other in many situations. And with that new collaboration, um, we're going to be able to, in the future, pivot much quicker and be able to do those risk assessments much faster and be able to adapt. And I'll add to what Patty said, listen, assumptive risk analysis, that, that pertains to everyone within all facilities. You know, there is no longer... There's so much cross-pollination between job functions within all commercial facilities that it's no longer just that one dedicated role. Okay, yeah, I might own it, but at the end of the day, who's responsible for the health and well-being of people that attend these events? 
And who's responsible for the safety and security? It's everyone. So when you talk about assumptive risk analysis, that is going to be everybody's responsibility to identify what the risks are, figure out a measure, figure out how to, how to identify, uh, how to mitigate it, and then how to measure it long term. It's kind of like the GBAT. We want our facilities to measure the results of this accreditation and how it works. Is it effective? Is it not? What works? What doesn't work? And let's measure it throughout the years, right? That's going to be so important. And I'll, I'll share this with the group because I think this is important. We pushed out a survey as to what were the top risks and the mitigating factors. And the top risk with the industry was reopening. That was that came out number one. You know, the reopening process appeared to be the main concern and challenge for the majority of venues and facilities. That was number one. And I think we've done a really good job collaboratively making people feel a little bit more comfortable about the reopening. As you can see, it's, start, it's starting to happen, right? The other was funding. Rick mentioned it. Funding was huge. That was out of 64 risk statements, 28% said funding was the concern. Um, staff payroll, right? No revenue. These were all the concerns. Health and safety is the other. And then, of course, the, the fourth was security, the safety and security of, of people. So you add all that up together, and it's like, what have we done up to this point to kind of relieve the tension and the apprehension? It's been through Patty's point, through education and training. And listen, if I was an attendee, going to an event, I want to see those folks that are in there working within those facilities to make sure that it is clean and safe for me to attend. I want to see the messaging that goes out that says, here's what we're doing to not guarantee, but assure we're doing what is reasonable to provide a safe, secure environment. And then I want to be able to know that I have to understand that teams, internal teams within those facilities are going to have to impose certain policies and procedures to protect not only themselves, but those that are attending. And there comes the other challenge where frontline teams now are going to be challenged. Think about this. People have been quarantined for so long, right? They're used to living in their bubble. Now they're going to an event and now they have to comply with your rules. And the simple thing of wearing a face covering, if it applies, can be challenging for a frontline team member. So we're really pushing out a lot of the de-escalation training and how to mitigate the risk utilizing the best guest service customer approach. These are all things that need to be considered. You brought up uh, a point there, Mark, about people coming out of their bubble and going to events. Mm -hmm. In the news recently, we've seen um, venues, stadiums say they're gonna have vaccinated sections and unvaccinated sections. We'd love to hear your thoughts on that, maybe a little bit from each of you. Mark, since you mentioned that to start, why don't you start us off? Yes, look, so there, there has now, there, there's now a division between those that have been vaccinated, those that haven't. I would, I would say that, is that, could that be a concern? Yeah, it really could. You're creating a division now between those that are, those that aren't. But again, if it's the internal policies of that particular venue, and there's the benefits to being vaccinated, that's something that is on the table at, with EOC saying, can you incentivize this thing? And that's, frankly, that scares me. That kind of scares me that you would even try to incentivize this. But again, you're going to have those areas, not only in venues or facilities, but even just, just going out to any facility, you're going to have those that say, you know, if you're vaccinated here, you, you know, you can sit here. If you're not vaccinated, then you have to sit here and you have to wear a face covering. Could that create some problems? It could, right? And how are you going to know, right? That's the other. What's the technology that's going to come out to identify those that have been vaccinated versus those, those that haven't? And these are the conversations that we're having to try to make sense of it. Yeah, and the news that I saw, they were saying that, you know, the unvac or the vaccinated section, you could take your mask off and do whatever you want. So, there, yeah, good, good, good comments, Mark. Thank you. David, what do you think? Is, it, is that going to work? Well, uh, as Mark uh, uh, directly ad addressed, but kind of softly addressed, you know, vaccine passports are um, very, very um, difficult conversations to have because uh, now, could you do it on an airplane, make sure that everybody is, is vaccinated, shows a card? How many cards are now, uh, Mark and Rick, how many cards are being hacked? and or our bogus you know, COVID cards, right? I have my 
Pfizer card and it's stamped, you know, could I have printed something like that off and, and replicated it? And all of a sudden it's a fraud card. So these passports are a big issue. And obviously from an organizer standpoint, if, if a venue or a jurisdiction, let's say it's city A or county B, says that in order for anybody to get into a baseball game, a, a football game, a convention center, they must go through a, a legally approved and certified passport program. What's it going to do to attendance? Boom. You're going to have a lot of people that are saying, I'm not going to I'm, I'm going to stay online and, and shop online. And I, I really need to go to that trade show, Rick, and I need to buy and sell and, and, and learn about new technologies and, and meet a consultant that's going to help me with my business. But you know what? I'm going to do that over the phone and over, over uh, the uh, platforms online, you know, the Zooms, et cetera. I'm not, I, it's too much hassle to go through a passport. So, Jeff, that's going to be a problem. So our industry is not supporting passports because they're going to cause us to have low attendance when we're trying to drive attendance. Yep. Yep. All due respect to health and safety. Mm -hmm. I don't know what, you, what the others think, but I'm hearing Rick, that loud and clear. I know Rick's going to say something. <laughs> well, uh, we, you know, we also work in stadiums and arenas, and we're seeing a little bit of everything. We're seeing, first of all, what I said earlier, that everybody's got to put their fingerprints on it. And this is something that GBAC might address in the immediate future in the stadiums and arenas. So I'll give you an example, some examples. We have some that are using the clear system. And people want to go on there and then they can prove that they've been vaccinated. It is not an easy process and it slows down admission. And then you have the people that don't have clear. I mean, clear is like two, one and a half to two percent of the flying population let alone the population. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's a program initiated by CLEAR to sell more CLEAR memberships for hundred bucks a year. Other venues have started the, um, we, we did a hockey game the last couple of nights and they were allowed 4,000 attendees. During the game, we had almost a hundred employees there just doing cleaning and disinfection for 4,000 employees, for 4,000 attendees. It was overkill. Why did we have it? Because the stadium, you had to enter through a specific entrance, stay in that section, go into your seats, could only use the, the restrooms and the food and beverage in that section. So every food and beverage outlet in the entire stadium and the entire arena had to be opened for a handful, and you know, Mark, you know better than me what it cost to staff, you know, these these food outlets and these beverage outlets. So it had to be a money loser because they might have had, call it eight nine hundred people in a section spread up and down from the top to the bottom, and of course the bottom section is verboten because you don't want to be close to the the athletes. They might have had seven eight nine hundred people in there, and they could have had. 20 cleaning people and 60 food, food and uh, beverage people to service them. It's, it's not sustainable. It's, I mean, kudos to them for the appearance of, um, you know, because safety is a primal instinct. And they're worried about people feeling safe. They're worried about trying to put their best foot forward. But you've got, now you go to the local jurisdictions, the cities and the states. Who told them to do this? You know, I mean, so it's something that, you know, you might send out a newsletter, or a, a, an email to your uh, Mark, to your members and, and Patty to your, your GBAC members. And maybe we should be with you guys should be working on something a little more standardized. That's a little less restrictive because my experience is they want to overkill it. If you say you got to do a, they want to do a, B and C, you know, look what we're doing. Hmm. We're making it impossible to get in and no, you can't go have the hamburger at that you know, you, you know how these arenas are today. They've got the best hamburger in the world in section 102, but you can't go to section 102. You have to stay in section 104. So, and then Rick, who pays for all that? <clears throat> well, the stadium owner. I mean, it, you listen, can't make money. You're no, better off not having the event. No, and, and and I know these guys personally, some of them, and you know, I feel bad for them. And I argued with their stadium management. I said, guys, you don't need. We want all the, okay, fine. You'll get all these people in here. 
and uh, uh, you know, basically they're running around. Uh, one person uses the giant restroom, and two people go in there and attack it and, and disinfect it after one person goes in there. You know, in a restroom meant for a hundred people. It's like, okay. I'm just worried about that burger I can't get to. <laughs> That's it. I mean, they got rope and stanchion up and telling people you must stay within your section, yeah. enter and exit through your, your, your assigned gates. And that's one way of handling it. Other people have uh, uh, required the vaccination passport to get in and uh, is still sit in your section. All of them have, uh, have subscribed to that I've seen. You must sit in your section. Yeah. And but is this going to go away in three months or six months? It has to. It's not financially sustainable to operate these stadiums and arenas like this. It's just not not sustainable. So, Patty, that's contract state uh, tracing to uh, to a, a degree that is, as Rick said, totally unnecessary. Absolutely. No, it, it, it absolutely. And I think that's where it gets to. Let's look at um, how we move forward. And we realize that I think, Mark, you had alluded to it a little bit, but validation, you know, when is clean, clean? When are we ready? How do we verify and validate? Uh, seeing some of these new technologies that are going to allow us to be able to do things that uh, maybe we didn't realize um, that we even had to pay attention to in the, in the past that uh, we're looking at now, some of the new air treatment systems that even the EPA is starting to think about, uh, thank goodness. And then also, you know, you know, the, the electrostatic sprayers, where are we going to go with that? Um, you know, encouraging the EPA to, you know, approve more chemistry to be able to go through those, um, come up with that algorithm, <laughs> whatever you need to do. But there is so much technology out there that I think will help us be able to argue that, you know, um, we put some handcuffs on our venues, like, uh, like our stadiums, arenas, and conventions. And we're not putting those handcuffs on other arenas, nor should we. Um, but then what can we learn and be able to, and what I've seen um, and what we've shown is that we can successfully have shows, we can successfully run um, you know, um, events and people want to get out and they're willing to do whatever they need to do to be able to get to those events. And so um, I loved your statement, David, about communication. We need to be better, do better about communicating to our participants what, why and what we're doing. And, you know, and we'll get there. But it's still- I mean, you go, Patty, you go into a Home Depot or a Lowe's, and I went into both this past weekend. There is zero, zero protocols and mm -hmm. mitigation efforts except you got to wear your mask and it says that at the door. So we've gone to the ridiculous, as Rick said, in many of these jurisdictions and arenas and convention centers and stadiums, there's no consistency, is there? There's not. And you know what, Dave? Rick said it best as well. You have to effectively manage your resources to where it does not become cost prohibitive. That's so important. And so how do you do that? Well, you have to understand what that baseline looks like. And that's the one thing that we have tasked all of our sectors, all of our venue types uh, within our committees and also our town halls is we have tried to figure out and identify what works for your specific facility of your square footage of your event type. And let's start building and developing that baseline so that everyone knows at a minimum, we need to do this. We maximize our resources. This is all we, we don't need to overkill it. Because now, from a cost perspective, to Rick's point, you're going to take a hit on the other side. So I think that is that's so important, is developing that baseline, knowing and understanding what it is. And listen, I'm going to say this again. Somebody, I, I received a call from a venue that said, we want zero risk. I'm like, shut your doors. That no one in this, no one can guarantee zero risk. All we can do is reduce the levels of severity by implementing certain measures making the attendees know that the venue has made every reasonable effort to provide a safe, safe and healthy environment. That's what's going to ease the apprehension. And that's what's going to assist us to mitigate a lot of, a lot of the risk. And Dave, your team has joined us on this so that we aligned with our guides, the public assembly recovery guides and your guides through IAEE. Listen, Scott and I made sure that they we coordinated our efforts to make sure that from meeting planners to service contractors 
to to the venues that we're speaking the same language. And and I think that in itself is something that needs to be messaged and communicated uh, as well. And I'll get off my soapbox. Well, it's great information uh, so far. We're about out of time. Patty, do we have any more questions? I don't think so, unless it's um, it, one of you gentlemen would like to share any last parting thoughts on, uh, you know, the future of mass gatherings. Patty, I think that uh, you and Mark and David have work to do uh, in with urgency about getting the getting a, a more concise. You know, we've we've done we've done great. We've all done great, but. Like I said, the, the differences would be between what's going on in Florida, what's going on in New York, what's going on in Illinois, and I could name it a bunch of other states. It's 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 craziness. Mm -hmm. And uh, to your point, Mark, they're looking for they're looking for leadership. They're looking for validation. They kind of know the answer, but they want you to validate it. They want Patty to validate it. They don't want to hear it from me. You know, they want to. They don't want to hear it from Dubois. They want to hear it from you guys. Yeah. You know, you lead their venues and you lead the science on this. What is the best practice we should be following in a convention center, in a stadium, in an arena? What is that practice and how do we get that word out like instantly so that they can go to their town fathers? They can go to their, their owners and say, we don't need to do this right now. Because that was part of the whole GBAC program is as the world turns and things evolve, the Patty science team would say, this can go away. Or let's add this, and I do think that the air uh, filtration, fil purification is a more correct term, is going to be the thing of the future. And that may make masks go away sooner, or at least make them optional sooner, making people feel safer sooner. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, well great you. information, and we appreciate all your the time you've given up today. This is episode one of maybe two or three on mass gatherings we're going to do. So uh, we just scratched the surface, I believe, Patty. We'll get into more details later for sure. Absolutely. Well, thank you very hey, much. Jeff, I just want to say thank you. And David and Rick and Patty, it feels great to be the dumbest guy in the room because <laughs> I learned from these folks. Yeah. <laughs> you took Dubois off the hot seat. He's wow, reserved you know for years. If, if Jeff and Patty, if they weren't members, I, if, if this wasn't a public uh, um, recording, uh, I'll get you guys offline. <laughs> what our viewers did not see is the pre-show commentary from you three, and uh, I don't know if they could take it. So, <laughs> well, Jeff, thank you, and Patty, thank yeah. you, and and say hello to Dr. Gavin and, and John and all the John. You have lots of John and Johns at ISSA. Of John. <laughs> do. But uh, we appreciate the collaboration and, and Godspeed and let's continue to get things open. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you all.